coronavirus pandemic. I'm John Lentz, City and State's Editor-in-Chief, and I'm pleased to welcome today's guests, Dr. Saira Madad. She's a Senior Director of the System-Wide Special Pathogens Program at New York City Health and Hospitals, the nation's largest municipal healthcare delivery system. She's a nationally recognized leader in public health and special pathogen preparedness and response. She's also an assistant professor in the Graduate Biotechnology Biodefense Program at the University of Maryland and core faculty in the National Ebola Training and Education Center and assistant secretary for preparedness and response. She's also an alumni fellow in the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity at the John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Health Security. You may also have seen her in the 2020 Netflix docu-series, Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak. Also joining us today is Dr. Saskia Popescu, an infectious disease epid epidemiologist and infection preventionist, and is also nationally recognized for her work to build hospital response to infectious disease events. She holds a PhD in biodefense from George Mason University, a master's in public health with a focus on infectious diseases, Masters of Arts in International Security Studies from the University of Arizona. During her work as an infection preventionist, she managed Ebola response, a 300 plus measles exposure and bioterrorism preparedness in the hospital system. She's managing editor of the Pandora Report newsletter through George Mason University. And like Dr. Madad, she's also an alumni fellow in the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity at the Johns Hopkins Public School, Bloomberg School of Public Health, Center for Health Security. In fact, they're both in the same class. Uh, however, I must emphasize that both of these experts are speaking on their own behalf today, not on behalf of any agency or academic institution they're affiliated with, so as to speak freely and more broadly about the public health response to the crisis we're now in. Blah, 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 blah. We do the presentations. Um, John? Yeah. I'm going to stop you for a second. I think we went live a little early, so um, we have... Okay other people coming in. So I just want to, we're going to try to figure that out. They don't catch our uh, <laughs> practice session. Oh, okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to City and State's latest digital discussion in our webinar series on the coronavirus. Today's topic, medical perspectives on the coronavirus epidemic. I'm John Lent, City and State's Editor-in-Chief, and I'm pleased to welcome today's guests. Dr. Saira Madad is Senior Director of the System-Wide Special Pathogens Program 
at New York City Health and Hospitals, the nation's largest, largest municipal healthcare delivery system. Dr. Madad is a nationally recognized leader in public health and special pathogen preparedness and response. She's also an assistant professor in the graduate biotechnology biodefense program at the University of Maryland and core faculty in the National Ebola Training and Education Center and assistant secretary for preparedness and response. She's also an alumni fellow in the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Health Security. You may have also seen her in the 2020 Netflix docuseries, Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak. Also joining us today is Dr. Saskia Popescu, an infectious disease epidemiologist and infection preventionist, and is nationally recognized for her work to build hospital response to infectious disease events. She has managed Ebola response, a 300 plus measles exposure, and bioterrorism preparedness in the hospital systems. She's certified in inf infection prevention, hospital preparedness, and pandemic preparedness from the DHS Center for Domestic Preparedness. And she's also the managing editor of the Pandora Report newsletter for George Mason University. Like Dr. Madad, she's also an alumni fellow in the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Health Security. In fact, they were in the same class. Uh, welcome, doctors. Thank you. However, I must emphasize that both of these experts are speaking on their own behalf, not on behalf of any agency or academic institution they're affiliated with, so as to speak freely and more broadly about the public health response to the crisis we're now in. Before we get a few additional things, uh, first of all, thanks to our healthcare partner on this summit, Affinity Health Plan. With the unprecedented job loss due to the current health crisis, Affinity Health Plan is here as a resource to help educate the thousands of New Yorkers affected about the health coverage options available to them. Uh, second, uh, many of us are on Zoom every day through work and for other reasons, but I'll point out a few functions uh, if you're unfamiliar with them. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can send questions anonymously if you don't want your name attached to it. Uh, we will take audience questions at the end, as time permits. You can also upvote a question if you see a question you like. If there are a number of upvotes, we're more likely to ask that question. There's also a chat function um, that you can also click at the bottom of your screen. You can control who sees your chat contributions. Um, we ask you to comment on the topics, react to the speakers, interact with each other, but please do keep it civil and focused on this discussion. On Zoom, you can change the view settings in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Some of these settings will differ if you're watching on a mobile device instead of a computer screen. If you're on a phone or tablet, you may need to scroll down to see the various screens and options. Now back to our guests. We'll kick things off with a presentation from both panelists and Dr. Saskia Popescu, over to you. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to start this presentation and give you a little oversight into healthcare preparedness and what we're seeing right now. So the first part in this is realistically, as we discuss healthcare as a critical infrastructure, I think sometimes we don't understand what that realistically means. And in the United States, we have a very, very unique approach to healthcare. For one, we have over 6,000 hospitals. And that means we have 6,000 hospitals that need to be prepared for biological events, both intentional and natural. And this means we have almost a million beds and we spend a lot of money on healthcare. But I think one thing that Dr. Madad and I see repeatedly, just like public health, is sometimes we don't focus enough resources on preparing healthcare systems, these over 6,000 hospitals, for biological events. And COVID-19 is a great example of that. So I'm gonna give you a little oversight into what this, what we've seen and the implications of this. So healthcare, hospitals, and public health, this is um, an integrated marriage, if you will. Hospitals are the front lines. You know, when people get sick, where do they go? They're gonna be going to healthcare facilities. And it's really up to the healthcare facility to be able to identify, isolate, and inform. And if anything fails in that process, that's where um, transmission of disease can occur, or we don't catch it fast enough and report it to public health. So it's a critical piece, not just in identification and isolation of an infectious patient, but also sharing that with local and state public health departments so that they can pick up on potential outbreaks and report those up the chain. So I think this is a critical piece right now when it 
it comes to rapid identification isolation of patients, but also recognizing trends, making sure we're using isolation precautions appropriately, and ensuring that we are having a very harmonious relationship with public health. And I, I know as an epidemiologist, um, we're so dependent upon the data that comes from hospitals that I've seen, you know, when we just send lab reports, sometimes that's not enough. Having patient information, relevant travel history, all of these things paint an overall picture of what we're seeing in the community. So I'm a few things that I think are important to share. Hospital outbreaks <laughs> are not new. Um, hospitals can easily act as epicenters for outbreaks. So we're going to go through a few of examples of this. And the first is not surprisingly, Ebola. So in 2014, we had a, our first unexpected, if I you will, patient. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my Apple Watch is trying to talk to you. So what we're seeing in this case is previously all patients with Ebola coming into the United States, we had known about and identified ahead of time. This was the first situation where somebody walked in through the emergency department and we were not equipped for it. We weren't prepared for it. And the truth is, nobody really was going to be prepared for it. We hadn't really anticipated this to be the case. So unfortunately, as a result of this, we had two ICU nurses who did become nosocomial cases or secondary cases related to healthcare transmission. And unfortunately, that resulted in, in a lawsuit, which is a little, a little challenging because through that lawsuit, we identify a lot of um, failures in our processes in healthcare whether that means we're just not prepared for it, how we're providing staff with the guidance for making sure they're um, equipped with the right PPE, that they know how to use the right PPE. One consistent challenge I always see is we assume healthcare workers have the knowledge and the skills to use PPE because they've been trained, but when was the last time any of us put on some of this more unique PPE? So th these are um, very unique challenges that unfortunately we learned a lot from. And this was a very novel situation because the truth is no hospital in the United States had really ever trained for this. We had never anticipated a patient with a viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, your infection prevention and control programs ended up primarily being responsible for them, but unfortunately were quite understaffed to begin with. So when you have an entire workforce that doesn't have the PPE competencies and the guidance is constantly changing, I'm sure this sounds familiar to a lot of <laughs> people right now, um, it's very taxing for your entire hospital system to hopefully get more prepared and respond to these. So in many ways that that saying, you know, we're building the bridge as we walk across it, or in this case, run across it is very accurate for um, the 2014 outbreak. So then there's SARS-CoV, and, now, and this was um, originally in 2002, and there's a lot of information in this, but what I really want to focus on is what we we saw in Toronto, and Toronto is really interesting because we had a single patient who came in to a medical setting, and through that, <laughs> that index case, if you will, um, we realized that hospitals can really act as amplifiers for disease transmission, and unfortunately, that means if we're not really on it with isolation precautions and communication, then we can easily just amplify the spread of disease. So one particular piece in this was really sharing the challenges in PPE, but also this is a novel situation. This was a new disease, so how are we handling PPE when the guidance is changing? Again, I know this sounds familiar. And how are we handling when isolation precautions are discontinued? So we have two phases in the SARS epidemic, in this case in Toronto. And at the end of phase one, they actually relaxed precautions in hospitals. You know, they said, you don't need to be wearing as much PPE in all these areas and they downgraded it. And unfortunately, that's how we led to phase two. So I think this is a really good learning lesson in terms of how hospitals can act as amplifiers if we're not really cautious about our infection control measures. Because it's not just about PPE though, it's also about social distancing and congregating in areas, large meetings and things like that. So next um, is the MERS COV outbreak. Now this really started in 2012, but what I wanna draw your attention to is really the 2015 outbreak in South Korea, because we learned a lot about this, again, hospital transmission, which we um, have continued to see in Saudi Arabia. And a lot of this is for, you know, for my fellow healthcare workers, things that you probably can say, oh, that makes sense. Delays in isolation, busy emergency departments, um, asymptomatic patients, 
you know, uncontrolled patient movement. <laughs> That's always a challenging piece. And a lot of visitors, because this is a huge component to healthcare and patient wellness. You know, we want people to have visitors, but if you have symptomatic visitors or, you know, they're, they're visiting someone who's in isolation precautions, but not wearing their PPE, and then going down to the cafeteria, that's always a concern. So, but in South Korea, we saw a really widespread case of healthcare related transmission. And ultimately they found some pretty fascinating aspects of the healthcare response that encouraged transmission. Some of this was delays in isolation or lack of airborne isolation, especially during aerosol generating procedures. We did have asymptomatic patients in this case, but also a very unique healthcare system because they're all unique, but this one, was particularly interesting in that um, they had patients, they had about four patients per hospital room. And as we know, that's not an ideal situation, especially if you have a droplet spread organism where people are coughing. So you have four patients to a room. And then it was very common and almost expected that family and visitors would engage in the care process. And this meant that not only did you have those four patients plus their healthcare workers, but then you also have had all of these other people in the room engaging with the patient, touching the surfaces and the environments and all of these things. And that really um, helped amplify the spread of disease. So, and not to mention a lot of infection control failures. <laughs> so these are things that we really learned in 2015 and I think have shown a lot of, um, a lot of onus on why we moved to single patient rooms, but also the role of visitors and, and, and families, if you will, and that we need to account for them in the infection control process. And when we're dealing with an outbreak, make sure that we're keeping them safe, but also not, not encouraging them to amplify anything. So Nipah virus is a little bit um, less of a common one, simply because we don't see a lot of outbreaks of Nipah, but there actually have been some healthcare transmitted cases. And I think this is good insight into not only the one health component, but also emerging infectious diseases and their propensity for healthcare transmission. And that we really need to be investing in awareness for special pathogens, for emerging pathogens, and how our hospitals in the US are looking at them because this is not a common disease. So how would your hospital, if you work in one, respond to a patient with NEPA? Would we adequately isolate them and communicate that to the health department or would there be delays in that process that could potentially lead to secondary cases? So hospitals really ultimately play a very unique role in outbreaks and infections. Um, you have sick patients plus their visitors plus hundreds of healthcare workers. This is a ripe environment for disease transmission, especially in an outbreak. Um, you know, the truth is that we already have substandard infection control measures or practices, I should say, in the United States. Um, you know, um, Dr. Madad's healthcare system has put so many amazing resources into special pathogens preparedness. And as they've noted, some of the hardest things are just getting people to wash their hands. You know, we're all struggling with that. So as we focus on making sure everybody's wearing their N95s appropriately and doing the donning and doffing, this critical piece of foundational infection control is often something that can cripple us. So we really have to go back to that and emphasize we have to build the infection control measures into preparedness. And we know that hospitals can easily become amplifiers of these diseases because especially in more advanced medical settings, we have more invasive medical practices that can put healthcare workers and any, you know, and visitors even at risk. If you look at the amount of aerosol generating procedures we're doing right now, that's extremely um, dangerous for healthcare workers. And the list of those procedures that require N95s and airborne isolation is quite lengthy. And that's a result of a great healthcare system capability, but also something we need to account for. So when we think about hospital outbreaks in the event of one, you know, you have an influx of people, whether those are the worried well or the sick, but that volume of people are exponentially going to amplify the infection control failures we know already exist. And we know right now, I think what we're seeing is, is very telling of that. This was a pretty severe flu season, which already strained hospitals across the United States. You know, we were already at pretty high capacity when COVID-19 started to hit in the US. We have international PPE shortages. I, you know, I'm not gonna belabor that point too much because I think we're all seeing that just daily. Um, and I, you know, I think that's really challenged the healthcare side because as we look at extended and reuse or UV disinfection or you know, whatever disinfection methods, this is an entirely new process to infection control measures, but also ensuring that staff feel safe. When you're asking them to wear a mask all day, when previously we said, oh, you throw it out every single time you leave the room, 
that's, that's a weird thing to say. That feels very much against their norm. And having those conversations about, well, we didn't have to be good stewards of our resources before. So here is the time that we need to be. This is a novel disease. So there's a lot of fear and a lot of unknown. And, you know, we're seeing exposures, we're seeing you know, little clustered outbreaks of this. And it's, and it's hard because I think one of the challenges I see a lot of that healthcare workers are seeing things on the news or hearing stories from others and combating poor information, combating that fear and making people feel supported with, you know, with the resources and the training they have is so important right now. And that's extra challenging when we have changing guidance, you know, going from N95 to surgical mask and then back. And what do we do with that reuse and extended use? But also what the White House says versus the CDC and versus WHO, all of these things, if there's any difference at all, people pick up on it. I've never seen people read those websites so closely. <laughs> and I think that's been really, it's, it's great that they're reading, but it also makes that, um, that trust aspect very difficult. So, you know, for those of us who are not in New York, which is being hit very hard right now, seeing that as that five minute heads up, you know, that tornado warning, as I like to call it and say, okay, so this could be that bad. How do we prepare for that? How do we avoid that? And that's, and that's a really difficult piece right now as people ask when we're going to kind of reopen things, because the truth is we're all dealing with something a little different. And it's, it's very weird to not be seeing those levels in other states and wondering, is that going to happen? When is that going to happen? Or can we reopen? So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Madad, and thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to just cover high level, just you know, some of the planning um, that has gone on behind the scenes, not just for COVID, but just when we talk about special pathogens in general. So this is one of my favorite quotes. You know, planning is plans are nothing. Planning is is everything. All of us, from a healthcare delivery standpoint, have plans in place, whether it's for a pandemic situation um, or something that is more minor, uh, even from an all hazard standpoint, planning for hurricanes and tornadoes. But what we know is plans are worthless. You know, um, in a situation that we're currently in requires a completely different approach. Uh, it requires a lot of just in time planning to uh, look into a lot of the nuances and additional factors that may not be part of an actual plan. So a lot of these plans are obviously on the on the shelf collecting dust, but when we talk about planning, that is a, an essential element of anything that you do. And it is a continuous cycle of obviously gap analysis um, and improvement. So there is obviously a great distinction between the two. And another one of my, uh, you know, uh, quotes that I like is from Mike Tyson, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so we need to obviously make sure that planning is one, uh, plans are one thing, but we need to continuously plan for the unexpected, especially when you're in an emergency situation where you need to continuously look at, you know, what's on the horizon and what you need to, con what you need to change. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about the current situation that we're in, we know that emerging infectious diseases are increasing at an alarming rate around the world. So if we recall the major problems we had in SARS, um, it's essentially almost playing out again, but by tenfold. Um, one of um, uh, one of uh, the, the good books that I recommend on SARS is, you know, how a global epidemic was stopped, um, SARS. And in that book, it talks about how SARS showed explosive power, uh, setting off multiple outbreaks around the world, often zeroing in on hospitals, attacking doctors and nurses, and bringing some public health systems to their knees. It buckled economies, crippled international trade and travel, and sent shocks uh, and, and sent um, stock markets into a slide. That's actually a couple of slides from the book. And as you can see, we are obviously playing out that same scenario today. So what's happened between now and then? Um, what we know is that the 2003 SARS uh, you know, um, epidemic was supposed to be a wake-up call for the world to be ready for these types of things. We had another wake-up call, you know, H5N1, the avian influenza the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, Ebola in 2014, Zika, and then Ebola again. We're obviously in another um, outbreak, the second largest outbreak of Ebola in the DRC, which was, you know, coming under control, but, you know, some flare-ups there. Uh, so all of these, you know, were wake-up calls for the world, not just the United States, to make sure that, you know, we need to continuously plan for these types of events. They're not one-off events. We know that we should expect these events. Um, fast and furious are going to continue to come, but we need to make sure we have a good preparedness um, system and infrastructure in place. So unfortunately, uh, the world did not get the message, not just the United States. 
and we became complacent afterwards. Um, and one of the things that we know is that time is not on our side. And any type of outbreak, whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic uh, or another outbreak that we experienced previously or another one that we're going to face uh, in the future, time will never be on our side. Um, and so right now, it seems like we're running a marathon. Um, and we know that obviously there will be light at the end of the tunnel, but we need to obviously overcome this current uh, crisis that we're in and then ensure that we learn from the lessons uh, of this crisis that we can apply to the future one that we know will come down the pipeline, but we can be better prepared for it. So, you know, at Health and Hospitals, um, I oversee the System Special Pathogens Program, and we do continuous uh, drills, trainings, you know, to, to maintain what we call our state of readiness. And so, for example, um, you know, in the year uh, 2018, we conducted over 50 different drills and exercises of different scope and severity, everything from tabletop to, uh, you know, uh, operation space exercises. So we did literally over 50 of these of different scenarios from, uh, you know, MERS. We actually did a few MERS. We, we did um, viral hemorrhagic fever. And then in 2019, we did a little over 40. Uh, the most recent was in December, actually, um, right? Uh, just a couple of weeks before the World Health Organization was notified of COVID-19, we did a very large scale citywide exercise on Ebola with six different health and hospital sites. Again, you know, looking at the plans we have, but then dusting them off and making sure is that if we do have another case of viral hemorrhagic fever, that our entire system was prepared for it. Um, and so we are constantly in the state of, of maintaining our state of readiness, but you know, every outbreak is unique and it requires a different approach. And obviously with the COVID-19, this is something where it's completely all hands on deck. And this is something that no one has obviously experienced before. And we're learning uh, very much, uh, you know, as we go along uh, every hour and day by day. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about hospital preparedness, um, whether it's COVID-19 or any, you know, other, um, you know, uh, all hazards uh, impact. So whether it's SARS, or it's COVID-19, or it's a hurricane or tornado, we tend to do our planning in terms of the five S's, staffing, staff, space, and system. And I'm gonna briefly talk about each one of these in the context of, of COVID-19. So I'm gonna first start with stuff because this is, what some, this is obviously what is all over the news in terms of PPE and ventilators and, and, and uh, all the other uh, equipment and supplies that everyone constantly is hearing about. So from uh, an international standpoint, and even from a domestic standpoint, uh, are dangerous. We have a very dangerous vulnerability in our supply chain. And the reason for that is because first we rely on a just in time supply chain. And what that means is that uh, at any given healthcare facility, we have enough supplies based on the needs. So based on what is being used at that, you know, given time period and then some, um, you know, healthcare systems and facilities around the nation don't keep a very, a very large uh, stockpile of additional uh, PPE because first, maybe you may not know, PPE does expire. And so when you're looking at getting uh, different types of equipment and supplies, you obviously look at your inventory, you look at you know, your burn rate, and then how much is actually being used. What's different in COVID-19, as you can imagine, it's all hands on deck. So everybody requires you know, all the different PPE that, it, you know, that you're need, that's needed in this type of um, situation. That wasn't the case in a non-COVID-19 uh, world. Uh, so we were obviously preparing uh, for, you know, and had uh, inventory according to what the needs are. Um, and this is also why even at the federal level, you have contingency plans in place, like the strategic national stockpile. That's a completely different story. And everyone can obviously hear about what's happening with the SNS and at the federal level. But more at the local level, you know, our needs obviously are based on a just-in-time supply chain and, and then obviously uh, ordering, uh, you know, uh, an excessive uh, surplus of it based on obviously what the needs are. Um, and the other thing to obviously note when it comes to stuff and, and the supplies and equipment is that over 80% of our active ingredients for all of our pharmaceutical um, products are sourced in China. That's a very dangerous dependency on one country. And so when we talk about the supplies and equipment that we need, Again, a lot of it depends on a number of different factors. And so, you know, everyone wants to question, well, how come you didn't have enough N95 and how come you didn't have enough gloves? Well, you need to look at the totality of the picture. And there's several factors that influence, obviously, when we talk about that category of stuff. Um, going on to space. Um, so when we talk about space, you know, we, we know real estate is, is a big asset, especially here in New York City. Uh, so, you know, converting areas for clinical use, both traditional and non-traditional settings. Um, what you're seeing on the news, what you're hearing from, you know, a number of individuals is a lot of makeshift hospitals popping up, which is amazing. We are 
uh, you know, um, increasing our uh, bed availability uh, by threefold, fourfold um, almost. Um, at health and hospitals, as you may know, we have nearly tripled the base ICU capacity um, at our 11 hospitals. And just over the course of April, um, Health and Hospitals has created nearly, uh, you know, um, 762 ICU beds, more than any other hospital system in the country, um, and basically added nearly uh, close to 3,000 medical beds. So that is a huge capacity in terms of, of space, uh, but space is only as good as the people that are in it, right? And so you can create as many beds as you want, but if you don't have the healthcare staff to man the bed, well, then that's useless. So when we come into the third category of staffing, as we know with COVID-19, it is an all hands-on approach. So again, you can create all the beds you want, but you need to have somebody uh, obviously manning that particular bed. And so for every bed that uh, that I just mentioned. So all of those over, you know, um, you know, uh, close to 800 ICU beds. Every one of those beds represents a, a heroic and courageous healthcare worker that is treating that patient in there. Um, when we talk about staffing, obviously we know that, um, you know, this is another big impact area, and staffing is obviously the number one asset to any different any uh, any healthcare system and really any uh, workplace. You know, you, you obviously can't function without your staff, and so. Um, you know, this is where uh, collaboration from a city, state, and national level is, is taking place, not just on staffing, but also on the staff uh, in terms of supply and equipment, but very much on the staffing. Um, and the last thing I wanted to just quickly mention is, is a system. So Health and Hospitals is obviously the nation's largest healthcare, uh, municipal healthcare delivery system, and it functions very much as a system. We have uh, amazing leaders at Health and Hospitals where you're able to look at, you know, different facilities and see what one may need and then, you know, have a collaborative, cohesive, uh, you know, system where you are able to collaborate and provide those resources to where it's needed the most. Um, so all of this, basically is much easier said than done. You know, while I'm talking about very high level points, a lot of work, a lot of manpower, and a lot of individuals are working behind the scenes to make all of this happen every hour, every day. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm sure everyone at this point is familiar with the epi curve uh, and the notion of flattening the curve at this point and, and what this means and what role we all have in, in terms of flattening the curve. But the peak and the plateau mean two different things. And I just want to make sure people just understand what these two terms mean. So when we say peak, the peak means that um, cases obviously are at an all time high. So it's at a maximum. Um, and then a traditional definition of a peak is that after it obviously goes to that all time high, it then goes down just as quickly as it shot up. That's not the case obviously when we talk about uh, a plateau. And with a plateau, the cases are still extremely high, so hospitals are still surging, extremely busy, um, but you are obviously seeing a slower in the number of cases that are obviously coming up. Um, and so here in New York City, obviously, we are at a phase where we are at that plateau, but this plateau can last for days, weeks, months. No one obviously can, uh, you know, guess with high accuracy how long this plateau is going to last. But again, a plateau does mean that we are still surging of, uh, you know, of, at a very, very high level. Um, and, and the ERs and the ICUs and all these other alternate care sites are obviously uh, still, um, you know, um, basically extremely busy uh, during this time. So, you know, once we're on the other side, so once we're on the other side of this peak, of what, once we're on the other side of this plateau, you know, we can apply more case-based uh, interventions and not a community-wide social distancing measure. And obviously, a number of factors have to come into play. Uh, in terms of how do we get to the other side and what we need to do um, in, in, a, in a societal uh, fashion and, and obviously uh, working together. Um, and so while isolation and, and, and hygiene are effective in reducing the chance of infection, one of the things uh, people may not realize is that it does little to increase our own personal resilience to the virus. And what that means is that, you know, all of these public health measures, obviously isolating, everyday um, respiratory measures and, and staying home, it's obviously reducing the chance of getting an infection and helping flatten that curve. But then as an, at an individual level, it's not doing anything to obviously uh, increase our personal resilience. So if we do get infected with coronavirus disease, how can we suffer less and how can we recover faster? Well, that depends on how obviously healthy you are. It depends on a number of different factors at the individual level. And so this is a, a great time to make sure that, you know, uh, you are, um, you know, healthy. And what that means is that 
you know, if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension and you decided not to take your medication for whatever reason, it's a wonderful time to make to, to start taking those medications, making sure that you yourself are, you know, uh, maintaining your own health. So, you know, if you do uh, contract um, coronavirus disease, then you have a higher likelihood of obviously suffering less. But that's not to say that you know, just because you're healthy doesn't mean that you're not going to get infected or you'll have, you know, a, uh, a less of a severe case. What we're seeing with COVID-19 is that even the healthiest, even the youngest can obviously get infected. So nobody's invincible, but we want to obviously make sure that everyone's increasing their chances of having a much better outcome. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sorry, if we can go to the slide before. Um, so the risk of resurgence. So we talked about obviously the peak and, and, the, and the plateau. Um, but now, you know, everyone wants to know, well, how long are we going to be in this plateau um, and what can we do to open up the economy and to, uh, you know, you know, loosen up these social distancing measures. And you've heard uh, Mayor de Blasio has been doing a wonderful job and, you know, educating the public and telling, um, you know, everyone, the New, York, New Yorkers where we're at and where we need to be um, without sugarcoating a lot of uh, this information, various indicators in terms of when, you know, we can see uh, how, you know, how well we're doing and when we can start lifting some of these measures. And he's obviously mentioned hospital admission, people in the ICU, and then our testing capability. But another thing to obviously look out for in terms of making sure that, you know, we are on that downward trend and we don't risk this, the, this notion of, of resurgence is looking at the number of deaths per day. We want to make sure that number of deaths per day are also lowered. So right now it's hard to just look at the number of confirmed cases because we know that it's skewed and not a lot of people are obviously getting tested. So it's not a great metric. And we really do hope, obviously, in order for us to look at opening up the economy and, and you know, um, loosening up the social distancing measures, we need widespread testing. Um, but we also need to look at, obviously, the number of people that are dying and making sure that that number, obviously, goes back into the, the double digits or the single digits for a period of time. And that's when we know that at least, you know, we're, we're on the right track. Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't ease up prematurely, uh, you know, um, on this epidemic because we can, you know, risk a epic rebound if we do. Um, and it would, you know, and obviously we would go back to the current state that we're, we're in today if we do obviously open up uh, too early in terms of lifting social distancing and opening up the, the economy. So a lot needs to be done uh, for this health crisis to end, including implementing widespread testing, vigorous testing to identify and isolate and track new infections. But just as important, we need to make sure we have a fast turnaround time. And so when you get tested, we want to make sure that we're able to provide the results within hours, not days. Because what we know is that this virus spreads exponentially, and a delay in even a few days can lead to major differences. And so we need to make sure that we reduce that turnaround time. Uh, and so when we talk about identifying infected people and isolating them and tracing them, you know, that requires uh, a lot of manpower. Uh, so countries, for example, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, they did this uh, and to a, to a tremendous effect. And this is not something that we're doing here in the United States yet. We hope to obviously implement that in the future when cases are at a manageable uh, case count. Uh, but in order to target these new infections aggressively and isolate and contact trace, again, you need a lot of resources to do that. And we want to make sure that we have uh, a more public health soldiers, if you will, to be able to, to implement this, this task that is going to occur uh, in the very near uh, future. Um, and so when we talk about testing, one of the things obviously that I'll mention before we go on to the, the next slide is this whole, the testing fiasco, which really was the original sin uh, of America's failure when it comes to this pandemic, uh, really the single flaw that undermined every other countermeasure, unfortunately, uh, and really hopeful that, you know, at least for New York City, we are on the right track. And I really hope, around, you know, across the nation, we, we begin to expand our testing capability, but we know that there's obviously a number of factors that come into play when it comes to testing. It's not just as easy as okay, let's buy the test kits. Well, there's actually issues with the supply chain with the test kit, um, you know, and rolling all of that out. So a number of different factors that come into play here. So much, much, again, again, you know, easier said than done. But the last thing that, you know, I'll mention when it comes to the risk of resurgence is, you know, Americans play a very large role in getting us to this post-coronavirus, um, uh, you know, era. So if we want to look, if we want to obviously aim for a post-coronavirus America, there's two things we need to make sure that we do at the individual level. 
first, we need, it depends on how we choose to act. We need to continue to abide by the social distancing measures. We need to continue to abide by the public health um, guidance that's coming out, uh, you know, through our agencies. But the second thing that all of us need to do is, is that will play a very large role in this post-coronavirus uh, America is, you know, what we choose to believe. Um, and this goes to my last slide. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this contagion of uh, misinformation, if you will. Um, and so when we talk about this contagion of misinformation, this is not a new concept. We have battled, you know, this contagion of misinformation in every single outbreak that we can recall. The most recent was measles. I'm sure everybody re remembers in New York City, the big measles outbreak we had recently, and this huge contagion of misinformation. So, uh, you know, anytime we have an outbreak, we're always fighting two different aspects. The outbreak itself from a scientific and healthcare standpoint, but then also this contagion of misinformation. So even before, unfortunately, coronavirus arrived um, and turned all of our lives, uh, you know, upside down, you know, we had uh, a lot of misinformation out there uh, on social media, um, you know, on a number of different things. And now amid this rapidly evolving pandemic, it's very important now more than ever that we rely on credible sources. And we rely on uh, individuals that obviously have scientific and medical knowledge that can be trusted to provide these resources. And so, you know, we're also at a point where there's so much misinformation that a lot of people have to debunk what is out there. Um, a lot of different videos out there of people trying to debunk some of the most common myths, um, which is great, but it's also unfortunate that it has to be that way because people obviously are believing and going to uh, sources where they think are true and then spreading that misinformation to others. And so we wanna really make sure that, you know, when it comes to misinformation, similar to social distancing, we all play a role uh, a crucial role um, in combating misinformation. So before sharing anything, even at the individual level, before sharing anything, think carefully where it came from, verify the source and its evidence, and then double check uh, that source to make sure that it is credible. If it's suspicious, please do report it. Um, and if it's something that is from a credible source, then certainly share it, uh, share that knowledge, share that with other individuals. But we want to make sure that people are getting their information from trusted sources. And so, you know, that is something that, you know, plays a very big role in any type of outbreak um, and extremely important right now, obviously, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic that we're in. Um, so with that, um, I think we can go to our last slide. Certainly happy to, to take any questions. Sure. Um, again, John Lance here, editor of City and State. Um, wanted to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Popescu, uh, you recently wrote a, a post about the importance of modeling in a pandemic. Um, what are the models showing us right now, both in New York and nationally? Is it possible to know if we've hit a peak? Is a curve flattening? And an, an audience question there too, what's really the best source uh, on, on this? I think the hard part with models is um, you have to take it with a little bit of grain of salt. Epidemiological models are based off of their forecasting. They're not predictions. So this is going to change every single day as we get more cases in, as we're learning kind of where that curve is going. So I, I do stress the importance when people are looking at them, the variables are they accounting for, and not to get so set on the dates. I've personally seen that where I've had administrators say, well, the peak in Arizona is going to be at this time. We know that can change. And the truth is that it takes at least a couple of weeks to see if our current efforts are gonna work appropriately and help decrease the case counts um, versus when we start to quote unquote, open things back up, you're gonna see a rapid spike. It's much faster to see that kind of change when cases increase. So, you know, we have to be mindful when it comes to cases. Um, you know. I, a lot of states are plateauing, some are increasing, some are decreasing. And that's, as Dr. Madad noted, it's very challenging right now when you're looking at preparedness across a nation and if we can relax some of those restrictions when we're all in different situations and the models that we are using for forecasting are constantly changing. Sure. Um, another question, what do we know about people who already have had COVID-19 and recovered? Could they get sick again? Could they still spread germs and or get other people sick? How long are people infectious? Do we know the answers to these questions yet? I think we're still learning a lot about the status of immunity and serology testing. Um, the CDC guidance has been quite helpful in terms of seven days following your positive lab or 72 hours after the resolution of symptoms without fever, um, AIDS. And I think, you know, again, we're, this is still a very novel disease. We're still learning a lot about it. So I hate to kind of give any 
the men's answer. Um, Dr. Madad, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think, you know, what you stated obviously is, is very accurate. You know, right now we don't still don't know a whole lot about this disease in terms of how long the immunity can last for even if you do get infected. Um, one of the things I'll mention is there's a difference between, you know, reading a, a you know, um, an article or report uh, and then obviously reading a scientific study. So there are a lot of articles out there that have talked about, you know, people getting reinfected with COVID-19, they didn't have immunity and, you know, the whole nine yards. Well, please, again, go make sure that you're going to a credible sources. These are reports. These are people that, you know, have no scientific background and they're writing these articles based on just you know, information they may have rece received. These are not scientific studies that, you know, that have, you know, um, uh, in, you know, a cohort of individuals that are studied over a period of time to actually look at the reinfection rate and uh, how long immunity can last for. That information is not available yet because, again, we're, this disease, this virus is only four months old, so we're learning every day. But, you know, right now uh, th that's a question that I think will hopefully be answered, um, you know, in the very near fu future. Sure. I'd like to mirror that. I think part of the problem, too, is we're so inundated with information um, and people are, are reading a lot about a single case and not necessarily or they're seeing preprints. And this is a definitely a big issue right now. And um, when you are reading, whether it's the news or things that are coming out in terms of a study that was just done, really look at the number of people that were studied. And is this preprint? Has this gone through peer review? Because a lot of the research that's being done right now is happening very, very fast. And we need to be mindful of the information and the science communication that's coming out too. You know, I saw this with the concerns for aerosolization and airborne. And the truth is so many of the nuances of studies um, aren't necessarily real world or they were in very isolated events. So when you're, when you're reading this, you know, as Dr. Madad noted, be mindful of, of what you're reading, who you're reading it from. Is this person an expert on it? Was this a study or are you reading it third hand? Because it's easy to um, get a lot of fear or, you know, the sensationalism out of some of what's being shared right now. Sure. And a quick detail, um, Dr. Madad, um, some folks wanted to know, you mentioned a book on SARS. Uh, what was the name of that book, the title of that book? Uh, let me go back. Uh, it's called SARS, How a Global Epidemic Was Stopped. It's by the World Health Organization. Got it. Great. Okay, uh, and then just another note for the audience. If you do have any questions, click that Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote uh, if there are questions that you like that you want to move up to the top of the list. Um, just one question. We have a reporter working on a story that um, was wondering, you know, just this week, and I think Dr. Manad, you alluded to this, uh, the de Blasio administration said it was taking steps to obtain and manufacture test kits. Will that allow the city to lift some of its restrictions or are there other factors that need to be considered? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't what, what, what's the question? Oh, um, this, um, the steps for the de Blasio administration to obtain and manufacture test kits. Um, I think in May, they'll really ramp up on the number of test kits available. Will that allow the city to lift restrictions on social distancing or, or are there other factors that also need to be considered? So testing is certainly one very, very large aspect, and we're certainly moving in the right direction. And it's great that we're able to obviously source uh, the test kits that is needed, um, but obviously there's uh, other factors that uh, go into play when it when we talk about lifting uh, restrictions. And so, um, you know, Mayor de Blasio has done a wonderful job outlining some of these other factors that we're looking at, you know, he calls them indicators or clues. Um, and so testing is one of them, but also looking at the number of hospital admissions, people in ICU um, and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's a, a number of different things that go into lifting uh, these types of restrictions. Sure. And then both on the national level and, and here in New York, uh, how are we doing in terms of protecting healthcare workers? Um, a, making sure everyone's adequately trained, uh, provided adequate supplies, and what, if anything, can the city, state, and federal government do on that front? So I can certainly um, start off. Uh, so, you know, this type of situation uh, that we're in requires coordination, collaboration, and, and communication from the local, state, and federal level. And we are seeing that, seeing that play out um, very much so. Uh, this is something that requires an all hands on deck approach. And so when we're talking about more equipment and supplies, you know, a lot of uh, different levels of government are working together to get the necessary uh, equipment and supplies that's needed. 
in a healthcare delivery environment, our timeline is hours, days, weeks. And so right now, certainly we have, you know, the resources that we need, but we know that this epidemic, we're in it for the long run. So we need to continue to have injections of these equipment and supplies to, to maintain that, that par level. Um, and this is why uh, we need to continue to advocate for, for more. Sure. I also wanted to um, go a little deeper on contact tracing. Um, my understanding is from what I've read, we were way behind from the get-go, especially compared to other countries. Um, what difference does having uh, enough contact detectives uh, make? Um, and and I'll, I'll point out, the, the New York Times had this great deep dive on the response here in New York. Uh, they talked about this 39-year-old woman who came from Qatar to JFK Airport. Uh, the governor said, um, look, we're going to track down every person who is on this woman's flight, but no one did. So it seems like from the from the very first day, um, the the effort there, the resources there were were not adequate uh, in New York. Can you can you speak to that? Yeah, I, contact tracing um, is a kind of a cornerstone in epidemiology, and I really think our ability to do it is very representative of the public health care system. Public health system um, we have and how well we're supporting them. So that means you know from the beginning, I think a lot of us have been saying we need to do better in terms of public health. Uh, resources. And if you can't do contact tracing in the very beginning, that's a pretty big indicator that your health departments are already struggling. So now when they're inundated, that means that we really can't do it. And the truth is that to kind of start relaxing some of these restrictions, we have to be able to do contact tracing because that allows us to not only identify a case, which is where that rapid diagnostic comes into play, but make sure that they're isolated appropriately and evaluate any close contacts they had within their period of potential infectiousness and get them to quarantine or make sure we're kind of communicating with them. Hey, you might be at an increased risk for acquiring this disease. Please stay home. Um, and our ability to do that is, is huge. That means we can kind of help control the outbreak, help break that chain of transmission. So when we're not able to do it, that really, um, it, in, just it prevents us from getting involved and disrupting the chain of transmission. And I think that's hard because it's very telling of a public health infrastructure and the resources it has. Yeah, and, and I'll add just a little bit more to that. So, you know, the, one of the biggest of the questions um, that ties in is, you know, how did we get here? Um, you know, one of the biggest issues we have been facing, not just from a public health standpoint, but also from a healthcare delivery standpoint, is the cuts to funding. And this is, you know, at the federal level. And so uh, many of you may be familiar with the, you know, hospital preparedness program and PETP, the public health uh, emergency preparedness program, both funded, you know, at the federal level. Both of these programs have continuously taken, you know, very large cuts. Um, in terms of its funding capacity over the years. In fact, when we talk about HPP, the hospital preparedness program, this is the money that from a hospital standpoint, we use to maintain that state of readiness. This is the money that we use to do our drills and exercises um, and, and you know, continuously train our, our staff um, with a lot of this funding. This continues to dwindle down. And so if you look at the hospital preparedness funding that has been allocated uh, for, you know, this year and future years, it's really at its all time low. I mean, it's extremely unfortunate. And the approach that we've always had here in the United States is uh, a very unfortunate approach uh, from a federal standpoint. And what this means is that when we have an epidemic, they uh, you know, inject uh, millions of dollars uh, for that specific epidemic. Um, and then once it's over, that funding is taken away, that staff is uh, you know, basically uh, is let go, if you will, uh, or repurposed. Um, and the expertise that was built for that that particular situation that can be extrapolated for many different situations, uh, you know, obviously doesn't exist. And, and a case in point, uh, in the Netflix docu series, one of the things that I highlighted, and even at the end, when you see me doing that Ebola exercise at Coney Island Hospital, and I'm talking about the funding, uh, the funding I'm speaking about is the Regional Ebola and Special Pathogen Treatment Network. This, um, you know, millions of dollars was, was al allocated in 2014 for this entire network of frontline hospitals um, and as um, Dr. Papisco has mentioned earlier, you know, we have 6,000 hospitals in the United States. When we talk about the regional Ebola and Special Pathogen Treatment Center that was established, you have 
frontline hospitals, assessment hospitals, Ebola treatment centers, and regional Ebola treatment centers. And Congress uh, has now finally only approved uh, funding 10 regional centers. So these are only 10 hospitals. Now, if you talk about COVID-19, this is, again, I've mentioned this multiple times, an all hands on deck approach. Every single hospital plays a role in this. And so all of those frontline hospitals, those 6,000 frontline hospitals, they're not getting any funding. So that funding, unfortunately, is supposed to set to expire, um, you know, this month. And, and there's, there's no indication from Congress that, that that work is going to be renewed besides the 10 regional centers. So that shows you a huge problem in our approach to infectious disease uh, preparedness uh, and, and how we need to continue to prepare in, and invest in preparedness dollars. Um, and that's not the case right now. And so we really need to have a different approach moving forward. When I think, uh, coupling on that, too, we also have... Um, you know, as Dr. Madad noted, we have funding for now, you know, those 10 regional centers, but for the rest of the thousands of hospitals that exist, there's really no incentive for hospitals to invest in these costly prevention efforts and preparedness efforts. Um, unless you have hospital administrators that opt to invest in them, there's no requirement. There are emergency preparedness rules through Medicare, but unfortunately, they're not specific to infectious diseases. So I think that's a huge gap. And whether we're looking at it from a national level or even your local hospital, unless they decide to put money into this, there's, there's no priority for it. There's no federal mandate. Sure. And one audience question, uh, we talked about the, the federal aspect here. Uh, what city or state policies need to change? I think we definitely need to, need to put more money into public health because, um, you know, hospitals work very closely with their state and local health departments to ensure readiness. But if we're all in the process of getting funding whenever an outbreak or a pandemic occurs, um, it's going to be dwindling. So my concern is there's just not enough resources for local hospital coalitions, for the HPP to really be focusing on that. And then also bringing in the public health departments to collaborate with multiple hospitals in the areas. And then uh, for those of us, uh, this is an audience question, for those of us who are not medical professionals or scientists, what are the reliable sources we can turn to uh, that do accurate reporting? Um, Second, you know, yeah, <laughs> go for it, Dr. Madonna. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I always like to encourage people, um, if you are following someone on social media, look to their background, look to who shares their information, because um, most of us in the field all know each other and we share each other's names, we encourage each other. So I think that's always a red flag. If, you, if they're kind of on their own, look at their backgrounds. But, um, you know, there's so many great resources. Um, Stat News is really wonderful. Um, you know, um, Ed Young has been really great with the Atlantic. I mean, there's, you know, but also Scientific American, the CDC, the WHO, you know, those are your steadfast sources that you want to stick to. But I think it's very easy to see sensationalism. And I, I personally stick to the CDC and the WHO. And then I know I follow my, my trusted resources, you know, Dr. Madad being one of them, but my virologists, my stats people, all of them, because I know that they're experts in their field and they're going to review the information before they share it. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, um, you know, I think also at the local level uh, here in New York City, another great resource that we have is, you know, your public health department. So, for example, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, they are really one of the best in the world. Uh, we have one of the best public health departments, um, and we have an amazing uh, leadership that, that, you know, obviously oversees the City Department of Health. And they keep a very robust and up-to-date website of not only the number of cases we have for COVID, um, but also additional recommendations and suggestions. And one of the things that we know for COVID-19 is that, you know, the response at, at the local level differs from state to state. And so, you know, some of the regulations and, and guidance may be different for New York City versus something uh, that's happening, for example, in, in California or another state in, in Utah. So just making sure that you know who your public health department is and, and reach out to them if you have any questions or concerns, but also look at their website and see what type of information that they have. Because I know from a city Department of Health standpoint, uh, we rely on them very heavily on a number of different things, and they have been amazing partners throughout this whole thing. I think also the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security has been really um, wonderful at sharing information, but also their GIS maps. Sure. Uh, another audience question. Yeah. Is there any indication that there may have been cases in New York City as early as December 
uh, symptomatic but negative flu test that were not yet identified as a COVID. Um, will we ever know how early a case came to New York? So, you know, one of the testing that's, that's going to be up and running hopefully soon is, you know, the, um, the, the serology testing to see, you know, who's, who's immune, but we can also do some genetic analysis and look at the footprint of, of uh, you know, the, the virus. But I think it's still, you know, it's very hard to tell when the virus obviously first started here in New York City or New York State. We were essentially, at a national standpoint, blinded to, you know, when this epidemic started here and how many cases we had early on, and even now, because of the whole testing fiasco. So, you know, it's something that, you know, we'll probably learn more about as this epidemic continues and a lot more people uh, look into this and investigate of when, you know, let's just say patient zero first arrived here in New York City and, and New York State. But uh, right now, I think, um, you know, that's something that uh, is to be determined. Um, anything that you'd like to add, Dr. Popisco? Um, well, I also think that's a really great re reason to invest in public health because it's your epis that are going to be doing that investigation back and doing that um, epigenetics too. So another reason why we want to really increase public health funding and support for this is because they'll ultimately be doing that and helping us identify some of the gaps that were very prevalent in the beginning and how we can fix those for the future. Sure. Um, one more audience question, and I know Dr. Madad, you have to hop off right at three, uh, so we'll respect that uh, and make sure you get off in time. Uh, but one more audience question. With the news that COVID-19 can linger for how long in the air, what are your recommendations for elevators and also for air ducts and apartment build buildings? Should we seal the vents? Dr. Pisco, you want to take that or you want me to? Start off. Um, I'll, I'll definitely start off on that one. I think, yeah, um, yeah the, the um, airborne question is one that I think we've all heard so many times. Um, the truth is that, you know, when we're, we're, again, we're still learning so much about how long things are lingering on surfaces, but, you know, droplet transmission, they tend to kind of hover in the air and then they fall. And as long as you have an HVAC system and air circulation, that's definitely gonna help. Um, obviously, if you're trapped in an elevator with someone who's coughing a lot, that's not ideal. And that's why mask wearing can be helpful because it, it really is about containing the microbes that somebody is coughing out. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't suggest taping off air ducts because you want air circulation. You know, you want um, the HVAC system and the HEPA filtration to be working. And if you if you tape those off, they won't. And we we need that. We want that. So I wouldn't encourage that. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard to maintain social distancing in elevators. Um, that's why the community mask wearing is encouraged for that situation, especially. And I think you know. It's, you know, <laughs> um, hand hygiene really goes a long way. If somebody is coughing and you're in an elevator, get off the elevator or, you know, ask them to maybe cover their cough, but please don't um, cover your, your um, vents. And, um, you know, most of us, we're very fortunate where we have HVAC systems that constantly are recirculating the air. So I'm not as worried about that. It's more in a closed environment with no air circulation for a prolonged period of time that I would worry about. Sure. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, obviously the elevators is a, you know, a just a certain situation that you're in, but this is why, you know, the recommendation is to keep that six feet distance because, you know, when you, many of you may have seen, you know, an image of somebody coughing or sneezing and you see those, you know, uh, you know, viral particles, if you will, spewing out, you know, um, you know, these are respiratory droplets and they don't travel extremely far in that sense. And so this is why we want to make sure that you keep that six feet distance to, you know, not, uh, you know, inhale those, those particles or, you know, if you're around those high touch surfaces, you don't touch those uh, surfaces. And so, you know, all of this kind of makes a full circle and makes, you know, makes sense if you look at the whole epidemiology of transmission of viruses. And when we talk about COVID-19, still a lot for us to still learn and new information is still coming out every day. Um, but we know we can rely on at least the foundation and backbone of what we know based on other viruses and the mode of transmission uh, and just general respiratory, uh, you know, viruses in general. Sure. And Dr. Manad, I know you have about a minute before you have to hop off. Um, just want to ask you, uh, I know you've talked about watching the film Outbreak, in 1995 film, um, that was a turning point for your career. What did it get right? What did it get wrong? 
you know, with, with these Hollywood movies, you know, this is something that obviously as uh, growing up, I used to love watching and I loved to, used to love reading about these things. And, and Outbreak uh, was one of the movies, as you've mentioned, that really helped kind of, you know, get me interested and pursue the career that I'm in. You know, with all of these types of uh, Hollywood blockbusters, if you will, there is some truth to it, but largely, you know, it's, it's sensationalized. But when we talk about the fear that is generated, when we talk about, you know, the chaos uh, and what we know and what we don't know, a lot of that is true. And now we're living through it right now with COVID-19. You're seeing, obviously, uh, the effect that it's having not just on uh, individuals, but it's also having a large effect on the economy and society in general. Uh, you see, obviously, um, how many different agencies uh, are playing a part and uh, epidemic response. It's not just public health departments. It's at the federal level. It's at the state level. It's at the local level. And you're also seeing a number of people come together to respond to this incident. So, you know, a lot of that is depicted in, in these movies, but, you know, a lot of it's also sensationalized. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, see what is true and what is not. But, you know, uh, there is some truth to it. Um, anything that you wanted to, to add, um, Dr. Pisco? No, I mean, I agree that the chaos that it causes is an important component to this. But, um, you know, every every one of these movies does sensationalize, like the whole scene with it going airborne. We know that's not how yep. viruses work. <laughs> um, so please yeah. take it with, you know, with just a grain of salt and that it is a movie. Um, but you know, the most important thing, again, is getting information from the right sources. Great. Uh, thank you. And, and Dr. Madad, thank you. And I have to hop off. Uh, appreciate everything uh, you shared with us. Uh, a couple uh, final closing points. I'd like to thank our audience. Um, a question has come up several times. Will this be shared? Uh, the video, barring any kind of technical issues, should automatically be shared with any registered attendee. So you can go back in and watch this again. Um, I'd also like to know, we have uh, two more of these at least coming up. On Thursday, April 23rd, it'll be managing the impact of COVID-19 on your nonprofit uh, with three nonprofit leaders. Also on Tuesday, April 28th, so the small business perspective on the coronavirus pandemic with Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez, the chair of the small House Small Business Committee, Greg Bishop, Commissioner of New York City Small Business Services, and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Affinity Health Plan. With the unprecedented job loss due to the current health crisis, Affinity Health Plan is here as a resource to help educate the thousands of New Yorkers affected about the health coverage options available to them. Once again, I'd like to thank both uh, Dr. Saskia Popescu and Dr. Sarah Madad. Uh, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you.